Okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Donald Sadaway, and I'm sitting here in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, electrochemical pathways towards deep decarbonization and profitable sustainability. So uh, Professor Fabio Miani has invited me to, uh, to speak with you today, and I'm delighted to do so. And um, so I'm going to keep it brief. It's going to be less than 30 minutes, but there's plenty of time for questions. So I'm not going to run away, but rather than speak 55 minutes and then have uh, two or three minutes for questions, <clears throat> pardon me, I prefer to give more time for questions. So I'm going to do this as a vignette. So it's all about uh, decarbonization of manufacturing. This is a big uh, topic for... Uh, uh, deep decarbonization, and uh, steel making is uh, right at the top of the list. Uh, and if you take a look at 1950, the big difference from 1950 up to 2019, gigantic jump in, in uh, tonnage. And uh, it, it's going to continue to rise because if we want to build the modern world. We will, uh, we will have to use uh, steel. Uh, but with the 1.8 billion tons of... Uh, Steel, uh, it's about two, two, two tons of CO2 per ton of steel if you use the blast furnace. And so that was 3.4 gigatons of CO2, which in 2019 was about 9% of total CO2. That's not 9% of the CO2 that comes from the manufacturing sector. That's total CO2 is 9%. I remember Bill Gates... Uh, uh, said at one point he was with a group of people that were policy experts in uh, uh, decarbonization and they were rolling out all kinds of uh, proposals and he interrupts them and he says, so what's your plan for steel? And they look puzzled. <laughs> and he says, if you're not looking at steel, you're really not being comprehensive. You cannot talk about deep decarbonization without decarbonization of steel. Um, so uh, so where do I come in? So I want to invent beyond the blast furnace. I know that there's still some uh, DRI with the gas, but uh, you know this has been around for many years, but it really hasn't uh, grabbed much of a market share. Even with the price of gas coming down, it just doesn't compete. Uh, my thesis is that if you want to make tonnage metal, you need to make it as liquid. Um, so uh, let's, let's go back to the origin. Iron is found in nature as the oxide. You don't find na native iron, maybe meteoric iron, but the, apart from a few meteors, uh, iron is found as a compound, oxide. Uh, there's the hematite, Fe203, and there's a magnetite, Fe304. In both cases, you have to get the oxygen away to leave behind the iron. So it's a subtractive technology. And I reason that the electron can be a sustainable reducing agent because we can generate electrons uh, sustainably without having to uh, necessarily burn carbon to make the uh, electrons. And um, for many years at MIT, I was teaching a large uh, general chemistry class. And, uh, and uh, you know, there was one of the, the lessons about solubility in the the short form is like dissolves like. Well, if we have iron oxide, then that suggests to me that the solvent should be a molten oxide, uh, not aqueous. I don't touch aqueous chemistry. I laugh at aqueous chemistry because it's uh, 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 water is just not powerful enough to, to do anything on a tonnage basis. But uh, I know some people like hydrogen and things like that, but uh, I don't touch this stuff. So if I say like dissolves like, and I have an oxide solvent, and I want to use the electron as the reducing agent, well, that means it's going to be electrolysis. And it's going to be electrolysis conducted not in water, but in molten oxide solvent. So that's where we get it, because you have an oxide feed, so you dissolve it in a molten oxide solvent, and you want the electron to do your work, and so that means you have to use electrolysis. And that was the birth of molten oxide electrolysis. And, uh, you know, people laughed at me. I started this in the 1980s. 
when uh, uh, steel no one was concerned about CO2 emissions. And um, people thought that uh, if you're going to make something as cheap as steel, you can't afford to use the electron. It's a, it's a precious reducing agent. You should be using carbon. Um, so I said, look, molten oxide electrolysis is not quite so crazy. Uh, it, it, it looks like other electrolysis, but uh, b far beyond water. Maybe the closest uh, relation is uh, aluminium, where we use aluminium oxide, again, an oxide feed, but we don't use an oxide solvent, we use a fluoride solvent. But here, we will make pure oxygen gas as the byproduct. And if we do that, that's going to be a big disruption because we're going to dis uh, displace the uh, CO2 emissions with oxygen. So you have two products. So this is what the, the heart of the technology looks like. I call it the, the cell. This is the electrolytic cell. And you can see um, the anode coming in from the top and the bottom is the cell floor. And that's the cathode. And um, the uh, orange, the orange zone, I guess I can show it here with my mouse. This orange zone here is uh, the molten oxide electrolyte, which is the solvent. And so starting up here in the upper left, we introduce the uh, oxide, whether it's uh, hematite or magnetite, and it dissolves into the molten oxide solvent. And then by the action of electric current, we send current from the anode to the, to the cathode. And by the action of electric current, we uh, break apart. We see here the equation on the right. So it's FeOx, whether it's Fe2O3 or Fe3O4, by the action of electric current, this is decomposed into Fe, pure liquid, and O becomes O2 gas. And so let's take a look. So this is the solvent for the iron oxide feedstock. And by the action of electric current, we make liquid iron, which pools at the bottom of the cell. And the iron pools on top of the cell floor. This is probably a carbon floor. And the liquid iron itself is an electronic conductor. So at this interface between the molten oxide electrolyte and the, uh, the gray zone here, which is the liquid iron, we continue to uh, accumulate more and more liquid iron. And now at the other side, at the top, we take the oxygen and it evolves as gas bubbles on the anode. And then these gas bubbles rise to the surface and then we can collect them and, and make a tonnage oxygen. In, in point of fact, if you make a, a ton of liquid iron, you'll make about two thirds of a ton of uh, oxygen. That's on a mass basis, on, on a volumetric basis. If this cell is running at say 1650 degrees Celsius, which is above the melting point of iron, uh, the volume of the gas is about 16,000 times greater than the volume of the liquid. So it's a big management system. And then the action of electric current does two things. I've already told you that it it decomposes the iron oxide into liquid iron and oxygen gas. But the action of electric current also generates heat in the molten oxide electrolyte. And so the action of electric current keeps the cell at operating temperature. And so by this, we don't have external heaters, there's no gas burners, nothing. And now you say, how do you contain this thing? Well, I'm showing the frozen electrolyte on the side. So, so you could have non-uniform temperature distribution here so that in between the electrodes, it is highest temperature. And on the edge, it's a low temperature, low enough that the electrolyte becomes a solid. And so you basically have what they call is a, the skull. So this is liquid electrolyte inside a frozen skull of itself. And so that's the, that's the idea of the molten oxide electrolysis. <clears throat> now, the, there's a much lower capital cost here that uh, an electrolytic cell 
costs much, much less than a blast furnace. If you were to build a brand new blast furnace today uh, to reach the economy of scale, you would really need to go to about uh, 10,000 cubic meters uh, so that you would be producing on the order of 2 million tons of uh, liquid iron per year. And uh, capital cost would be probably about four or five billion dollars because you have to have, in support of the blast furnace, you have to have the coke ovens where you, you convert the coal into coke and then you can't just use any iron oxide. See here in the molten oxide electrolysis, I don't care if I have uh, big chunks of iron oxide, if I have fine particles, uh, everything is going to dissolve in the electrolyte. But in the blast furnace, you have to center into pellets of a certain size and a certain porosity. Otherwise, if they're too uh, dense, then by the time the uh, center reaches the bottom of the blast furnace shaft, it will not have been fully converted. If, the, uh, if, the, if you put fine powder in the blast furnace, you just blow the powder up the top of the blast furnace. When you, you won't even get to do any reduction. So there's an optimum size, and that requires the center plant. And then when the liquid metal comes out of the blast furnace, it has very, very high carbon concentration, unacceptably high for steel. It's okay for cast iron, but it's no good for steel. So then you have to go to the basic oxygen furnace, the next, or they call in Europe LD converter, the where you blow pure oxygen through the pig iron in order to get rid of the excess carbon and to drive the carbon concentration down to the level that you would find acceptable for steel. So coke ovens cost money, center plant costs money, basic oxygen furnace costs money. We don't need any of this here. We put iron ore into the cell and in one step, we convert the iron ore into liquid iron, very, very low carbon and oxygen gas. So there's a cost advantage here. And the other point is, I, I told you earlier that uh, if you wanted to bring the, the brand new blast furnace uh, online today, you would have to be producing on the order of at least uh, 2 million tons, maybe more, 2 million tons per year before you get uh, the economy of scale. Whereas with the molten oxide electrolysis, you can go easily uh, 10 times smaller than that. You could be on the order of some 100,000 tons per year. And, and then if you want to expand, then you expand. Of course, you need to have access to cheap carbon-free electricity. If you don't have cheap carbon-free electricity, this is not going to make any difference in terms of deep decarbonization. But that's the same issue with the hydrogen reduction. If you don't have carbon-free electricity, you can't make green hydrogen. If you're using brown hydrogen, the whole idea is stupid. So green electricity is critical. Um, so here's some early work at, at, at my uh, uh, laboratory at MIT. This is a, uh, an alumina tube, and uh, uh, it's operating at about... Uh, almost 1600 degrees. You can see it's glowing white here because down below where it's dark, this is where the uh, molybdenum disilicide windings are. So uh, this is where the, the electrodes are, the cathode and the anode. And you see up here at the top, there's a cap with the feed throughs. So you can have feed through for the cathode, uh, feed through for the anode, there's feed through for thermocouple. And there's even a port for a camera. So I'm going to show you what happens if you look through the camera. So this is 1600 degrees Celsius. And now we're going to look through the, the camera. And so you can see the plus, this is the anode. And this anode probably at the time was made out of platinum group metal, maybe uh, platinum or iridium. And you will see the gas oxygen bubbles coming off on the uh, anode. And then the negative, this is the cathode. 
And the cathode is the molybdenum plate. You can see the molybdenum plate, which is uh, positioned vertically. It's connected to the to the anode uh, for the for, forgive me the cathode current collector, and uh, so when this is operating, the passage of electric current generates oxygen here on the uh, on the anode, and here it's generating liquid iron, which is going to fall off and drip to the bottom of the cell. So let's see what happens. So you can see the uh, oxygen bubbling here. That was one of my students talking. So you can see it's, it's pretty viscous, but yet it's, uh, we're able to get the oxygen to uh, release. And then here we're making the, uh, the iron, which is falling to the bottom of the cell. So as I said, I was using platinum group metals and we knew that platinum group metals uh, were unsuitable for industrial uh, scale steel making on uh, we have to have something that's practical and so around about 2010 2011 uh, I had a brilliant postdoc come to me from uh, from Europe he came from Arcelor and uh, together we worked on uh, the discovery of a new practical uh, anode material and um, what it was is the uh, uh, Iron chromium alloy. It's about 90% iron, about 10% chromium. And this is the alloy as uh, received. And this is after operation for about two and a half hours at uh, 1565 degrees C. And you can see that this is still preserved. It looks, it looks ugly because this is the uh, frozen electrolyte, but underneath it still looks like this. And this is the metallography of this. So this is the metallic alloy core, the iron chromium. And on the surface, we're making a, a chromate, a chromate surface oxide layer. And that chromate oxide layer protects the alloy from further oxidation. Because remember, hot oxygen at 1565 degrees is bubbling off of the surface of this. And so it has to have a protective layer so that the alloy doesn't uh, oxidize and we don't have total consumption of the, of the metal core. Um, and then it also has to allow current to flow. And then this is the frozen slag, which is what you see here. And this ended up being published in Nature. This is a letter to Nature. Here's the cover of that particular journal. Um, and so this was my uh, postdoc, Antoine Eleanor, and then a second postdoc, Lan Yin. And uh, the, this was published in Nature in uh, 2011, I believe it was. And uh, I can't tell you how difficult it is to, uh, to get published in Nature, especially when you're working in something as uh, uh, mundane as uh, metals metals extraction. Oh, if you're doing something in a really cool metal, uh, physical metallurgy, maybe. But when it comes to uh, chemical metallurgy, extractive metallurgy, maybe once in 10 years does nature publish an article. So this was really uh, a big uh, boost for us because um, for Antoine, Antoine eventually hired on as a professor at MIT, and he's now become a, a colleague of mine and a, got promoted to full professor last year. And Lan Yin went uh, back to China and is a professor at, at Tsinghua University, which uh, is essentially the, the, the top school in, in the country. Some people call it the Harvard of, uh, of China. So th this was a really a big, uh, I call it a career maker. Okay, so now <clears throat> what happens next? So uh, uh, Antoine and, uh, and Jim, uh, Antoine Eleanor, who I've already introduced, and then a, a, another MIT former uh, student, Jim Yurko, they came to me and said, we have to start a company. And so we started the company Boston Metal, and Boston Metal was founded 
uh, with some, <coughs> pardon me, some seed funding from a, a Brazilian uh, geologist. And uh, we started the company around 2012, 2013. And then uh, beyond that, we had built the first freestanding uh, molten oxide electrolysis cell that didn't require external heaters, no uh, platinum group metals and so on. And we went out and, and raised money and we got money from the, the main investor was the Breakthrough Energy, which is uh, the billionaires club that Bill Gates had established. The engine was a, a venture arm at MIT. And then uh, this uh, uh, venture company out of uh, San Francisco, Prelude. Um, and so that was a Series A. And then came Series B, which uh, all of these first tier investors uh, continued to invest, but then we we attracted uh, Fidelity Investments, which is a big financial uh, uh, banking firm here in the United States. Uh, Piva used to be the venture arm of General Electric, GE. And then here we have between BHP, Australia, and Vale and Brazil. The two of these companies represent about two-thirds of the iron ore mining on the planet. Uh, BHP, BHP and Valley both chose to go with uh, uh, Boston Metal. And then we even got some money from uh, the venture arm of uh, BMW. So you can see that some people are starting to uh, line up behind uh, a, a practical approach to making carbon-free steel. And uh, so we put together a team, Antoine, Jim, and I, and uh, we designed the first uh, freestanding cell. It was about, I think, uh, 5,000 amperes. And this is from several years ago. Right now, we're up to 25,000 amperes, but this was a 10,000 ampere cell that I have a movie for. And you're going to see. So uh, now, this is a freestanding cell. So we have the anode coming in from the top and the cathode is on the bottom. And what you're going to see is we've learned how to open the cell and to tap liquid metal while current continues to pass. And anybody can break open the cell, but we figured out how to close the cell after we've tapped it. So, you know, in, in aluminum, they siphon from the top. They don't tap from the bottom but we now know how to tap from the bottom. So I'll, I'll let this thing run. So you will see uh, they're about to open the, the cell. And now this is liquid iron at about 1600 degrees Celsius. And they're gonna pour it into these molds down here and then eventually close the cell and, uh, and then let it go. So that's, that's where the company is now. And they're about to raise new money <clears throat> with the intention of building uh, uh, cells on the order of uh, over 100,000 amperes. And I think in, if you compare to aluminum, uh, once you get up over 100,000 amperes, people will start uh, respecting you that uh, you, you really are at the industrial scale. So uh, to, to summarize, uh, Boston Metal, uh, it produces better metal. This metal is uh, very high quality uh, with zero emissions. Obviously, you have to have carbon-free electricity, but the only emission here is the oxygen. Um, and there is no green premium. When I hear people talking about hydrogen, they say, well, yeah, there's going to be uh, premium on the cost of the steel, but that maybe that's going to come down and so on. We... Boston Metal will produce better metal, zero emissions at lower cost, because we don't have the uh, uh, center plant, coke ovens, basic oxygen furnace. So the capital costs are much lower, and we don't have to do any front-end preparation. We are now feeding iron ore. Iron ore goes into the cell, and steel comes out of the cell. And so I think with these three uh, attributes, this will lead to disruption. And here's one of our steel workers. This is Amanda. 
And uh, you can see that this is this is the face of disruption. She wants to come to work at Boston Metal. You know, uh, 40 years ago, the notion that the young women wanted to come and work in the steel industry, uh, this was unknown, but this is what we're having, having today. So uh, I'm going to bring this to a close with a, a few uh, opinions. Uh, so uh, I'm predicting an all electric future where almost all industrial chemistry will become industrial electrochemistry. In other words, if anything can be done electrochemis electrochemically, it will be done electrochemically. And then even in the case that you can't do it electrochemically, you have to resort to thermochemistry, that we will not be burning hydrocarbons in order to uh, get to the temperatures of the process. We'll go to electrical heating. Again, everything electrical, electrical. And uh, so to, to, to the students and the postdocs, I say that there's a, in my opinion, a bright future in electrochemistry and there's a bright future in uh, material science and engineering. So I'm really excited to see uh, the world today and then how the technology for uh, tonnage steel has changed so much in the last uh, 40 years. And uh, I think that for those of you who know some electrochemistry and are working in material science and engineering, uh, you've got something. Uh, I think there's going to be a employment in your future. So I think this is a good place for me to stop. And so I'll bring this to a close and then ask Professor Miani to, uh, to uh, curate the uh, questions. Yeah, thank you so much for your... Uh nice talk this is uh, the second uh, very nice opportunity for me to listen to you uh, directly uh, we have a composite um, public we have people from the industry uh, we have friends uh, from ukraine that, that now they've moved everywhere and uh, we have also some people from uh, industrial research uh, and so on and and uh, we have also some university professor yes. uh, so i think uh, it, it would be uh, correct uh, to ask you who are attending this uh, very interesting lecture if uh, we, if i can of course donald we, we can ask some questions to you so i'm from glencore i'm just wondering uh, a possibility just to uh to, uh, to for another metal, have you tried another metal, say copper or anything, or different metals for extraction? And another question is, uh, have you tried with DRI? Yeah, okay, so first on the other metals. Yes, uh, Boston Metal is focused only on uh, steel because that's their uh, mandate from the investors. Uh, now at uh, MIT, we did uh, many metals. So we, we took a uh, laterite, nickel oxide and in one step we went to uh, uh, carbon free nickel uh, we also took chromium we took chromium oxide uh, cr203 and uh, in one step we went to uh, uh, chromium but uh, as you know chromium melts above 1900 1900 degrees and um, my furnace could not reach 1000 uh, 900 degrees C. So we started with molten iron and then we uh, electro deposited chromium into iron. So we made carbon free uh, ferrochromium. Um, and then earlier, Jim Yurko and I, back around 2007, uh, actually had a, a startup company uh, that was uh, focused on making titanium. So in one step, we went from uh, TiO2 to liquid titanium. And uh, we were just uh, getting started. And then as everybody remembers, uh, the credit crunch of 2008 came and then that meant uh, all the investors uh, pulled back and um, that that uh, company had to, had to stop. But uh, I'm confident that, that you can do uh, direct electrolysis of, of other metals. Now you asked about copper. 
Uh, I think copper is a very interesting metal because it's it's absolutely critical for the green transition. Uh, if we don't have adequate copper, we won't be able to to build all of the hardware that we're going to need. Um, and uh, copper is found dominantly uh, as a sulfide, although there is some copper oxide. Um, so I'm I'm confident that that we could electrolyze uh, copper oxide. Now, when it comes to sulfides, that's a new question because uh, most sulfides, as liquids, uh, behave as semiconductors, and so that means the Faradaic efficiency of an electrolysis cell uh, is going to be unacceptably low. Uh, now, we've been doing some work at MIT, actually, in the, in the laboratory of Professor Alanor, uh, to look at uh, ways to make it practical to do direct electrolysis of a copper sulfide. So, I mean, your question is a, is a good question, and uh, I hope that uh, before long we'll have a good answer. So, um, uh, and then at the very end, you said something about DRI. So I, uh, I didn't catch that. If you, if you want to repeat that, please do. Yes, uh, DRI is a direct reduced iron. So I'm just wondering, uh, we, if we actually put in DRI into blast furnace, the production is increased. So I'm just wondering if you actually tried to put DRI to MOE cell, is it the production is increased too? So maybe that is a trial. Okay, so uh, now I understand your question. And the answer is no. Uh, we've been focusing on you know, feeding the cell with uh, iron oxide and then ultimately iron ore. We've not uh, tried to do something as... Uh, uh, by the way, I think your proposal is, is very elaborate. So uh, I, I have no experience with DRI. So to, to then put DRI on top of uh, molten oxide electrolysis, um, that's, that's a challenge for which I don't have a, a good answer. But if you have some thoughts on it, uh, please, uh, please make the suggestion. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And now here we have uh, Nicolas, uh, I believe Grundy, yes, from Thermocalc uh, Europe. And uh, please uh, make uh, your question if you would like. Can phone. you hear me? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Anya, thanks very much for this uh, very, very interesting presentation. Now, my question will be on, on lifetime of the cell. So I think there are, you talked briefly about the, the uh, the anode materials are this iron chromium. And the question here will be, what sort of lifetime do you currently get on your, your anode? And also, I would imagine that the cathode sees quite serious wear because you've got high carbon solubility in the, the liquid metal that probably floats on top of the, um, the cathode. So, so my, my question is all about the lifetime of the, uh, of the cell, where, what the current status is. Yeah, very good question. And um, uh, the the answer is that uh, we are searching to to give you an answer. Um, when we do the laboratory scale testing, there are all sorts of artificialities there that give uh, all kinds of optimistic uh, results. But but I know from other work that I've done in uh, upscaling uh, molten salt electrolysis is that the only way to know what the lifetime is going to be is to uh, run the cell at scale. So, uh, as I said in the talk, we are now running at 25,000 amperes, and uh, we're uh, working on uh, the, the fabrication of the anodes and, um, and then getting data on what is the wear rate of the anode. Uh, on the bottom, you're you're correct that if if we go with a carbon bottom, there would be some carbon dissolution. So again, we we uh, design the cell in such a way as there's a temperature gradient there, and so we we try to keep the the carbon at uh, uh, at the, at a lower temperature. And in fact, if if we wanted to, we could even uh, have some frozen uh, iron on top of the carbon. Um, and, and that way, try to uh, cut off the uh, solubility of carbon. Um, 
And then, of course, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on inert anodes for aluminium. And uh, in that case, uh, one of the big uh, indicators is uh, metal purity. Because if you have an inert anode for aluminium, because aluminium is so reactive, its uh, cathodic potential is so negative that almost anything that ends up as an impurity in the electrolyte will co-deposit with the aluminium. And then you will end up not only consuming your anode, but contaminating your metal. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, Alcoa did some work with uh, uh, nickel ferrite. Uh, if you get iron and nickel in your aluminium beyond a really tiny concentration, then that metal is not marketable. So, so we're, we're quite mindful of the various um, uh, metrics that uh, we have to achieve. And uh, uh, that, that's the, the big challenge in front of us right now is, is to get some numbers on that. Because, you know, if the inert anode is being consumed and it doesn't ruin the metal product, then the consumption of the inert anode then becomes essentially a capital cost to the, to the process. We would like the anode to be truly inert. We, we realize that there will be some erosion, but if the erosion is uh, too, uh, too great, then um, we're going to have to be using the anodes as almost like a replaceable cartridge, and uh, that means that the product metal will not be cost competitive. So... Um, uh, ask me the question about a year from now. Maybe I'll have a concrete answer for you. Great. Thanks very much. Very, very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to both of you for the question and for the answer. And then we have uh, now our good friend, uh, Lev. Uh, if you have a question, please, uh, Lev, ask it. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. <laughs> Professor Sadawi, nice to be in contact again. <laughs> if it's possible, I would like to ask a question about your laboratory unit. What is the capacity in terms of kilo? How many kilo of liquid iron you show us when you show the pouring from the cell? So the answer to the question is the I don't have the exact numbers, but at, at 10,000 amperes, so you, you, we can go back and, and, and calculate, but, but we're, we're, we're up into hundreds of kilograms uh, per day in, in such a cell of, of 10,000 amperes. So uh, this is, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's actually a little bit more than the uh, production of the aluminium because um, Aluminium is three electrons, iron is three electrons, but aluminium is uh, 27 grams per mole, whereas iron is 50, almost 56 grams per mole. So your productivity is uh, about two times in terms of mass uh, to that of the uh, aluminium cell. I see. I see. I see. Uh, uh, let me ask you about uh, specific power consumption in terms of kilowatt hour per kilo of molten iron, roughly. That's a great question. Uh, right now, in the in the these test cells, it's terrible. It's about uh, 30, 30 uh, watt uh, kilowatt hours per. Uh, uh, forgive me, th three zero um, kilowatt hours per uh, per uh, kilogram. Uh, but we know that based on our calculations and our projections, that at scale, at scale, when we get to the 200,000 ampere cell, that we should get that number uh, down to about uh, four to five megawatt hours per ton, four to five megawatt hours per metric ton of iron product. And uh, sorry, last question in in this line, uh, how long it takes in this particular unit to convert iron oxide to the molten iron? 
It's it's just the just take the computation of the of the current. There there's no kinetic barrier. So if you're passing current times say uh, imagine you have a uh, 100,000 amperes, then it's just the current times the time will give you the total the total mass of the production. So it's uh, uh, again just look for guidance. Look to uh, what you see in aluminium smelters. Yeah, there is no time delay. There's no like um, uh, resonance time because when you feed the cell, the uh, iron oxide or iron ore uh, is dissolving very quickly, and then subsequently it is being a electro deposited as liquid uh, at the cathode. So it's it's just just take the current and and see what your productivity is. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, and please uh, accept so our congratulations from Ali and me. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so nice to hear your voice, Lev, and uh, uh, thank you for your questions. What I want to ask you, um, Don, uh, is uh, that if you are aware um, of uh, the Innovation Fund uh, initiative, because the initiative Innovation Fund initiative. It is uh, an European uh, initiative for funding, uh, um, for funding projects which are ambitious and uh, on two scales. One it is so-called small-scale innovation fund, and one it is the large-scale innovation fund. What they have done uh, currently for the for the the steel industry, they have given a very big uh, funding for a project in Sweden, which is called uh, Hybrid, which is a big one, and this yeah. is the direction of uh, using hydrogen uh, for uh, cutting CO2 emissions. So the the um, to give you just. Of course, we understand that molten oxide electrolysis is not reducing oxides by using uh, hydrogen. It's totally another story. But uh, it is quite interesting, as for my impression, that uh, they obtain funding in a in a ten years uh, project landscape. Uh, so they got some one hundred and three hundred and four. Uh, so one hundred one three four. Yes, uh, millions of euros for cutting uh, third. 13.4 millions of CO2 uh, tons. So it is some sort of ratio that is easy to because there are the, basically the same number. So it is for very big projects because more than 100 uh, millions of uh, euros of basically dollars with the rate exchanges that I am not able to. But what would you rate your next step for molten oxide electrolysis? Would you rate in uh, the small scale innovation fund in, in the European term, which is something in capital expenses basically below 7 million uh, of euros, or would you rate uh, in the second category? So large scale innovation fund, uh, basically capital cost more than 100, even 150 millions of euro. This is the idea. So, which would could be the the next step to to scale up your uh, equipment to see uh, uh, the the real uh, consumption and the real troubles or the real benefits. This, if I may ask. So, which could be the the landscape of it, and if your initiatives could be uh, compatible to those, I think so. Uh, European project because after all uh, you are moving in a direction which is totally important for the whole uh, uh, society which is the carbonizing of steel you we have mentioned very correctly that uh, it is one of the necessary step for the the, the societal uh, decarbonization is it quite clear or should I repeat <laughs> no your your question is very clear so um you know, r right now, the, 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 the big uh, s uh, task before us is the upscaling. It's to mm -hmm. demonstrate that the technology works at scale. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no way to get there by operating at less than scale. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't just say, well, we did it at the lab bench at MIT. They'll say that doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we do it at uh, 10,000 amperes, 25,000 amperes. We can't do it 25,000 amperes and then tell people, okay, now you can imagine put one more zero 
and now we're at 250,000 amperes. They'll mm -hmm. say, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. And you had the questions uh, this morning or the, mm -hmm. the, the, today, mm -hmm. uh, legitimate questions. So what is your consumption rate of the anode? And, and, and what is the um, energy consumption per unit metal mm -hmm. produced? Mm -hmm. And you can't get those numbers because you don't have the, the same thermal conditions. Because yeah. as I told you, the current is generating the heat, but the heat is being lost by radiation through the periphery mm -hmm. of the cell. And the losses from a cell that's 200,000 amperes are different from the losses of a cell that's sure. 25,000 amperes. So uh, from my perspective, if, if we're going to have people that really uh, embrace this new technology, they want to see that it works at something that was competitive with industrial scale. And Lev asked also a fantastic question about, you know, what is your tonnage? What, what, how many tons do you pr produce per unit time? And the answer to that will be found when we can demonstrate that if we get to 200,000 amperes, we're starting to make uh, hundreds of thousands of tons per year. If we, if we don't do that, then people are going to say, we're waiting. We need to see the thing demonstrated at scale. So I think the answer to your question is, um, I don't think there's there's much of an appetite for the the, the small to medium scale uh, project. I think I think people are going to want to to see this thing really at scale, and I think that's probably the same thing that the that the Swedish uh, hydrogen people have also before them. People know that hydrogen will reduce oxygen from iron oxide, but can you do it at, at, at tonnage uh, scale? And so uh, I think that's, that's, that's what we have uh, on our agenda. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, it, the, the question that I typically get is, well, well what is the uh, reaction of the, the legacy steel makers? What about Arcelor? What about Tucson Corp? What about, you know, you can name all of the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. big players. And then, of course, you get to China and Asia mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, you know, when, when, when you go into a uh, sector such as steel, this is capital intensive yeah. and people are very risk averse and they're not going to take any chances. Nobody wants to be first. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to be first to be second. Once we demonstrate, <laughs> yeah, yeah, once we demonstrate, yeah. And, yeah. and one of those companies, uh, let's say uh, Arcelor decides, okay, we're going to put one of these MOE uh, smelters in place. Uh, and then they come out and announce that, yeah, this thing really works. And it's making high quality steel uh, at a cost that's competitive with the... Uh, legacy process and with zero CO2 emissions. At that point, everybody's going to want to uh, be participant, but um, everybody's waiting for somebody else to take the risk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Well, uh, with Lev and Anna, uh, when uh, we have been uh, sharing my office some uh, some weeks ago, not not ages ago we were uh, thinking about you know working you know that they are working in the field of uh, uh, electro slag remelting so those technologies oh, yeah. are related to steel but they right. are not uh, in the field millions of tons steel so so it is one <laughs> of the few uh, niche in, in in the city that you can speak about a production a serious production let's say 10,000 tons and it works mm -hmm. So, but if you prefer doing something else, it's okay. But I, I believe that special steel, uh, I, I believe um, melting devices like um, the, the one that they are making, it is com so you can produce uh, indeed uh, uh, steel, which is a uh, little bit more uh, valuable than standard steel. So it, the, the whole thing, it, it, it's, uh, it can stand on on its own uh, 
on the, in its own in, in industrial perspective. So, so we have, uh, you know that in Italy, but even in US, we have a lot of electric arc furnace still making, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's difficult to speak with a, uh, a mill uh, much less than, uh, would say 400,000 uh, tons or the like in, in this case, but if you are speaking about uh, electro slag remelting, Lev and Anna correct me, it is reasonable to speak uh, in, in the 10,000 years uh, perspective. So, so the investments are already in an industrial scale, so you can have some payoff by selling your product if the, the thing is successful, but it's not so enormous like making a, a, the millions of tons uh, steel making plant, which is uh, in a way a little bit uh, crazy to start. So it is, would be nearly, nearly impossible. We have some people from here hearing, I, I believe I saw, I saw for instance, the, 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 the leader of uh, R&D of Danieli, you know that we have a few uh, companies in the world that are making steel making plants. Uh, there is one, I wouldn't mention the name, one One is in Germany, one is in Italy, and the other it is partly in Austria. And, and uh, this, these companies are not as big as uh, uh, ArcelorMittal or uh, some uh, Chinese companies that are now producing in, uh, in, in, the, in the hundreds of, of, of millions of tons uh, or the like. But I, I think it, we should start uh, thinking about it and, and also uh, in United States and in Europe, we have different approaches. So uh, you, you have mentioned that you have um, venture capitalists, so, so you, you can get investment for, from the market, you can share uh, risk and, of course, benefits. In, in Europe, and most of it uh, in, in Italy, the point is rather different. So we start, we make b very big uh, uh, projects like this innovation fund, because uh, some seven projects, they have one, no, not the cost, but uh, the average value of the funding, it is 130 millions, which is quite a lot, is it? For, for just for, for uh, cutting CO2 emissions, but it must be on an industrial scale. So I think that uh, in the near future, there could be some, uh, some space to think about uh, something cross, uh, cross borders after all, to think about a small scale innovation fund, uh, which is in the range, uh, I would say for, for, Four millions, five millions of uh, euros to 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 get small productions, but still that you can, if you have the product, you can sell them, which is also the the, the requirements uh, of of this fund. So you can make something profitable, like you have mentioned in the, in the title of your talk. So if it works, it demonstrates that it can survive uh, the market, and so you can go on in this, uh, would say, small scale. Uh, production, but producing steel. The other opportunity that I was thinking to, but it is then smaller, to make uh, metal powders, but then the production is much less than, than these quantities. So these are just uh, uh, something to think, but I, I think it, it could be useful to, to just uh, not really sit around the table, but to exchange some emails uh, to, because Writing project is always a, 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 a good idea that you can start thinking to the real barriers and so, at least in Europe. In United States, it's a, it's a different story. You can find the capitals uh, directly from investors. Okay. So um, you raise a good point about uh, high value added steels because. Um, obviously, if, if you know breakthrough energy ventures, they want us to to tackle the you know the three gigatons of, of mm -hmm. CO2, and that comes from uh, simple steel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, but maybe the the path to profitability is to begin at an industrial scale. I told you that I'd made um, uh, obviously we made iron at MIT. We also mm -hmm. made nickel. And we made uh, ferrochromium, mm -hmm. so that means we could make virgin stainless steel, which mm -hmm. we don't have to go to any kind of uh, getting the carbon out of the the ferrochromium. So, you know, the price of stainless steel is much higher than just mm -hmm. uh, you know one one thousand series uh, just yeah. reinforcing yeah. bar yeah. and things yeah. like yeah. this. So, you know, the specialty steels and the the, the iron nickel chromium and i know that in europe you have this other uh line of stainless steels that have uh, mm -hmm. uh manganese 
and chromium. And we, d we did, in fact, the very first thing we did at Boston Metal, we got manganese oxide from Ukraine. And mm -hmm. we, we reduced manganese oxide because manganese melts at about 1,244 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Much more favorable than mm -hmm. for the first time to try to go all the way to 1,600 plus. And um, so if we can make manganese, we can make ferrochromium, then we could make... Uh, you know, chrome manganese stainless mm -hmm. steels and very, very low carbon mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. having to resort to the um, oxygen blowing and all of this other yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, I think you, you you make a good point about um, showing people, because if, if we do this with titanium, then the steel guys are going to say, yeah, but that's not steel. But, but, but if we make a stainless steel, at least it's, it's a, you know, it's still in the family, you know? So... Uh, well, I think we should continue conversations and yep. um, see if there's some some place to uh, to bridge across the Atlantic Ocean, um, mm -hmm. because yeah. you know people people have learned something from all of this uh, pandemic, and that is this uh, the theory of globalization. Uh, it, it's a theory, but when you come to the practical deployment of global uh, supply chains. Mm -hmm. They're very yeah. long and mm -hmm. they're very fragile. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that totally. people are going to be saying, well, you know, it would be more comfortable to have some steel production in, in continental Europe, not to have all the steel coming from China or from Brazil or something mm -hmm. like this. So yeah. um, I think, I think it's, it's a place to have the you know, conversation. Okay. Okay, I have just a very, very small <laughs> remark that we've been studying with my students, a recent paper by a colleague of us uh, in Germany, which was uh, the Rabe, and the Rabe has proposed an 18% manganese, 3% titanium steel, which proves uh, to be very interesting. I mean, substituting uh, manganese uh, instead of nickel, it is an interesting topic, but uh, we should think about which, which is a very lean uh, composition comparing to, to, other, to, to other steels. And I think one should start to think about it. And coming back to the, the topic of uh, steels produced by electroslag remelting, they have a value basically four or five times more than standard steel. So, so it's, it's something that can stay by its own uh, on the market, because here in Europe, uh, uh, the, the, I would say the price of steel average is a little bit less than 1,000 uh, euros for a ton. It is a little bit less. So, so if you are thinking to do something uh, ver much more expensive, uh, I, I think uh, producers of uh, 1 million, 2 million, so they, they, I already consider, yes, you would lose. <laughs> <laughs> some some euros on a, on a, on a kilogram, so we will lo lose something like several uh, thousand uh, of euros on a ton and blah 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 blah. But if the price is higher, then you, you can consider not not losing money but making money on this, and, and so it could be uh, like you mentioned profitable. Maybe we will discuss uh, the, the the issue later on. If there are no questions, and if there is, uh, uh, I would uh, suggest uh, that we finish here. Any other question, please? Even from the students, if I, there are some, uh, or from colleagues, uh, um, please do, because it is a very nice opportunity and Don is a very special and nice person, so we can have directly information question from him. So, Don. so uh, everybody, please uh, have a, a good rest of the day. For yeah. me, it's just starting. For you, it's yeah. much later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a little yeah. bit not not so late. But uh, we we've been uh, listening to you at least from uh, four continents actually, from Europe, from Asia, from Latin America, <laughs> and then uh, yes, you have. Uh, we are not a, 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 a huge public, but we have, we have a very nice conversation. So thank you to all of you for assisting. Also this, from uh, Australia. Yeah, so you see, you see yes, this, the midnight this was, here in Australia. Thank you so much. I was missing Oceania because we made some uh, talks with Professor Badesha from Cambridge, but we never had someone from Oceania. So I'm very pleased uh, to 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 be with you and thank you for your your questions and uh, it's an important okay. uh, point of view. Grazie mille, grazie mille. <laughs> grazie a voi. So thank you so much and hope. Uh,
we, there will be time to discuss more these uh, these topics. And thank you so much. Uh, uh, so, uh, Don, I will try to download the video and then I will put somewhere and then if, if it is okay for you, I will send to Professor Badesha to Cambridge. Okay, thank you too. Please, 